Hoffman is coming home. He's he started here. Oh, how sweet! <laughs> so Chris um, actually did his dissertation without any computing or any World Wide Web. Probably was it still was it going then? Oh, there was some new thing out there called Mosaic. Yeah, that's right. But it really wasn't going. So um, so his dissertation was on prehistoric metalworking in the glorious islands called the Mallorcan Islands, which belong to Spain, and they're very lovely, and we would go off every summer to this resort and um, tell us that he was doing our archaeological research, which he was. He created a very lovely dissertation on that, and I, um, I'm Ruth Tringham, by the way, for those of you who might not know, and um, I was one of his advisors. And at the same time, however, Chris had this other life, which many of the other archaeology students at that time had, in what was then called the Quantitative Anthropology Laboratory that was run by Gene Hamill and some other social anthropologists and demographers. And that was actually teaching them um, skills which are data analysis, computational data analysis, and other aspects of what he then went on to develop now. And so actually a lot of the, his um, cohort went on to work in IT. Surprisingly, perhaps not, since there weren't very many jobs in archaeology. And so maybe you'll kind of feel sympathetic towards that, those of you who may be at that point in your careers. So anyway, um, now uh, Chris has been working for a number of years with um, IT at UC Berkeley. At one point, he was overseeing the, the uh, IT services for the graduate division. At another point, he was working with the, uh, what was that media, um, that data thing, Vault. media? Media Vault. Yeah, the Media Vault uh, of IT. And he now has this illustrious position. Actually, it's not up there now, but the Associate Director of Research IT. And so, as, with that little hat, big hat, sorry, with that big hat, he's going to be talking to us today. Um, so that's, have I left out anything? He's also a good friend and we've known each other for years, but I won't say Does any more details. About, um, uh, performances and the Disney underplay of the art? Yes! Oh, you like <laughs> That's right. Chris was the lead singer and guitarist, perhaps still is, of a fantastic band, and when we remodeled my we remodeled my house. He came with all his band and did the whole kind of live music, and then used to also perform at the ARF um, any parties we would have in the atrium here. So this is your future, perhaps. <laughs> so any of you who are organ got the job of helping to organize parties at the atrium, just remember Chris Hoffman, very good guitarist and very good singer. Okay, okay. Well, and I have to say, uh, everything I know about presenting was because Ruth Tringham forced me into presentations. We did radio shows, all sorts of like experimental kind of media presentations. So anything that is either incredibly embarrassing or just wrong, I, I will credit Ruth with uh, in advance. Um, Blockchain projector. Great. So um, we're here to talk to you with Nico and with Aaron Kulich, my, my colleague in research IT, about some of the technology services that are available to you, and then to also ask you some questions about where technology um, should go on campus. Because I, I do work now for a group called Research IT, and we're really focused on research computing in, in the most diverse kind of definition of research and data and computing that, that you could imagine. Uh, we're also now part of a larger organization that includes educational technology services, the Center for Teaching and Learning. I'm, I'm happy to see my colleague Owen here because we're really trying to look at the campus community from this total perspective of, of your, your researchers, teachers, and learners simultaneously. Right? And What kinds of computing services and information technology services would be helpful to you? But while we're doing that, we're also going to show you some of the cool things that we're working on, that we're collaborating on with the ARF, and we'll just kind of take a, a tour through a bunch of these things. So Research IT, very broad mission here to, to help 
the campus research community, faculty and students help provide the best IT services possible. Um, we divide what we do up into a number of service areas, kind of consulting, which is kind of the heart and soul of what we do, Berkeley Research Computing, which has a number of different things it does, research data management, and then Museum Informatics is a, is a program that we've had for a number of years also. So, um, before I go into that, I just want to say that one of the things that we try to do is to, we try to be the liaison between you, faculty and students, postdocs, staff, between you and the, the kind of more nerdy uh, technology service providers in central IT. So, we can be kind of a translator and the bridge, so if you have questions, if you're having problems, you, you can come find us and we can try to really translate what you're asking for to the people in those offices. You know, unfortunately, we don't always have like the perfect answer or the perfect solution, but what we're also doing is trying to find out, well, what's, what is the need, what are the demands so that we can make kind of a, a better um, kind of case to campus leadership that there should be investment in certain kinds of technology. <coughs> Um, so consulting, again, I mentioned this is really the heart and soul. It's really what helps us be successful. We really try to be hands-on with people and understand not just the specific thing that they're asking, where can I store my data, but more kind of the, even the broader kind of workflow of your research so we can find out other opportunities to help you as well as what the real needs are on campus. Uh, yeah, so that, that really is how we think of ourselves as consultants and, and facilitators of research. So one of our biggest programs in research IT is called Berkeley Research Computing. And um, you can see this kind of our logo here for Berkeley Research Computing, which points to kind of the four different aspects of the program, with consulting at the center. And consulting here, in addition to being something we do in research IT, within Berkeley Research Computing, there's just some special things that they do there. Um, in fact, they, they have an NSF-funded cyber infrastructure engineer who can really help even with some of the kind of nuts and bolts engineering and a little bit of coding, you know, software help, to really, with, with a real focus on kind of data movement and how can we enable data to do more things. Right? Um, we've been hiring a number of domain consultants. Do you, Aaron, do you know how many domain consultants we now have in, in research IT through, through the yeah, program? So we have uh, three grad students or former grad students who are working at 25% time for us right now. We have two open positions that we're hiring for now. If you're interested, you know folks would be interested, please come up on. Yeah, so and this is so we can have people who not only know the technology, but know a domain. Right. And that it's that bridging and translating thing, that, that's been the, the key to what, what I've done here. Another thing that Berkeley Research Computing does, and I'll ask Aaron to talk about this, is we, we run a high performance computing cluster called Savio. And so, Aaron, do you want to just say a few things about that? Yeah, so um, Savio is a high performance computing system, which means they take a bunch of computers and put them together uh, with a fast network. Um, you can log into these nodes and submit what are called batch jobs. So if you have sort of a long running job, these computers can handle that where your, your laptop, you know, you have a follower if the computation is too heavy, or when you can't use your laptop for other things um, because you want to close it. Um, so we, we have a system that you can also um, yeah, and one of the things that we've been really good at is finding creative uses of this. It's like a supercomputer, so it's like astronomy and physics and and molecular things. Um, but we've been really creative at finding ways that you know, where people are trying to. They're really you all. You all are pushing the borders of what computing and, and data um, have done in this field. Um, Analytics environments on demand, or, or AOD, is basically a, a virtual research environment that we've been developing within Research IT, where we're taking advantage of some existing hardware that exists in the, in the campus data center and building virtual desktops on top of that. And we'll actually come back to that and talk about some work we've been doing with Nico to build out something that would really help archaeologists. So that you know, the notion here is, is that Right now, to, to get um, ArcGIS and your favorite statistical package and everything else running on your laptop, you're basically becoming your own system administrator on your computer, right? Well, what if instead you could log into a, a virtual machine environment, you, know, you just go to a website and log in, and, and you have it there. Right? That, 
that's kind of the notion there with the virtual research desktops. Um, and we'll say more about that in a second, a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so I, I mentioned that we're doing some interesting things. A lot of these research IT groups around um, the United States and even internationally are really focused on those high-end scientific uses, right? Um, but because our focus has always been intentionally broad, and we, we for a long time worked with archaeologists, with museums, with digital humanities, we, we looked at from the very early state at some other applications of these technologies. What could we do with a supercomputer for a humanities project, for an archaeology project? And just a couple examples here, we've done some really great things with OCR. Some of that has been focused just on licensing. Right? Abbey is great software, but it's expensive. So we invested a little bit of money in some Abbey licenses and have made those available. I, I think at the, where, where can people access those? Is it at the D-Lab, or do they send an email to Research IT to get access to the, to the Abbey service? Yeah, so in the D-Lab in Barrows Hall on the third floor, there's physical computers there where Abbey is licensed. There's uh, four licenses there. But we also have, in this AI environment, some place where you don't have to go to a physical lab. Just on your laptop, you can connect remotely. Um, and the shared calendar schedule the resource. And we can talk a little bit about that more when we, when we explain the AI is well, CR is probably all optical character recognition. So this is if you have text and you want it to be, if you have images of text and you want it to be turned into text that you could do some machine reading over or, or, or data mining. Uh, that's Chris, how you do that. Do you remember yes. what language Adam Anderson's using Abby Find Reader? It's like some ancient script. Yeah, it's right. Amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. It's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not after that. It's much better than that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Now there's another OCR software called Tesseract, I think, which is open source. That we've actually made run on our Savio high performance computing cluster. And we have some scholars who have massive amounts of text that they want to OCR. And they don't need to find, you know, Abby is really, is really incredibly good at OCR. But some, with some, depending on your research question, you might be able to run something over our high performance computing cluster. And then you're, you're running against just massive documents. So that's one of the other things we've done. Photogrammetry, so the process of um, creating 3D models based on photographs, that also has a licensing issue, and we've been working, we have a license for PhotoScan that we're using in a project that I'll tell you about in a little bit. And we've also pushed the, the photogrammetry processing off of laptops and into our more higher powered computing environments. <clears throat> and uh, Rita Lucarelli, professor in Near Eastern Studies, and her um, graduate student, Kia Johnston, have done some of that in partnership with, with us in research IT. And this has taken, you know, some of those photogrammetry processes can take you know, days. If you have large objects and lots of photographs, it can literally take days to do one step. And you've been able to push those to the high performance computing cluster where it runs in like three hours instead. So that has allowed them to be much more kind of iterative about you know, the processing of this. All right, so that was Berkeley Research Computing. One of the other things that we do that I'm more involved in myself is research data management. So this is a partnership with the library to look at the broad set of challenges that researchers have with their data, whether it's the data management plan or working with your data during the active phase of your research, trying to move it from one place to the other, trying to understand whether you can store it in one of the campus services, and then what you do with your data at the end of your project. So that's research data management. Um, and this was really because you know, funders are requiring that you have a data management plan with your grant proposal, that you're thinking about your data, a data sharing plan, how you're making your data available for the future. And you know, frankly, we were just getting a lot of researchers asking us, like, where, where do I store my data? I, I have more data than I've ever had before. Where can I put this stuff and, and still work with it in real time? Right? So these are the kind of questions that we're helping people with. And we're using a very broad definition of data. So it's not just about large scientific numeric or tabular data. It's about the digital inputs and outputs of your research. So we work with people you know, creating images of, of old books and things like that. That's, that's the data of your research, right? The great thing about archaeology is that we have so many different kinds of data. So archaeology is so great at challenging you know, what we're trying to do. And you all know that because you don't work with just one kind of data. By definition, we're looking at a whole bunch of different So, um, research data management, I will mention if, 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 there we go. 
so one of the things we do is we do consulting. So you can send an email to researchdata at berkeley.edu and uh, we'll get back in touch with you and try to put you in touch with the right resource if, or answer the question ourselves. Uh, we do got, we have a website, researchdata.berkeley.edu, which has some guidance and some information. We're always trying to improve that and add stories about how people have, have worked with data. Um, and just kind of making the case about this outreach and raising awareness is, is always a big effort. How do we make clear, really, the campus leadership that this is, you know, researchers out there are struggling. I don't know how many times I've heard from a faculty member that they've had to build a whole kind of storage environment in their lab and, and they're taking the backups home in their back pocket, taking some DVDs or something. You know, you know people who are becoming kind of technology system administrators because they don't have any other option. So part of this is making the case that we need to you know, take some of that burden off of the research community so that you all can really do the research. Um, part of that is looking at some specific areas. So the act, active research data storage, that, that phase of during the research, how do you really store your data? Where can you store it? How do you move it from the field to a data storage environment? How do you get it ready for analysis and later publication? And then a lot of um, issues around research data that have different kinds of um, security requirements where they can't just be put in an, any open place where the public can see them. How, how many people have this issue where the data they have has some kind of restrictions? You could just put it on a public website, for instance. I suspect many, if not most people, right? Some of it is just, well, these are valuable data. They're in process. I, I'm not ready to publish these, so I'm, I'm even concerned about that. Site, site location data. Site location site data is a really big one. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. In fact, I get to go to the SAAs this spring for the first time in like 25 years or something. Michael Black from the Hearst Museum of Anthropology and I will be talking about um, some work we've been doing with the collection management system they use. And one of their big efforts has been around kind of setting some rules for, for what information about field collection location can be published and to what audiences. And similarly, um, what, uh, you know, what objects cannot be made available or visible on the website at all. Right? Really important questions. And, and when you do something in an information system, you actually need to make those decisions formally and then somehow code the system to, to follow your desires. And that, that can be that way. Um, data management plans. We, we do a fair bit of work here, actually not as much as, as we might expect. I think most, how many people here have actually written a data management plan? I'm just kind of curious. So, so a few hands. Okay. So. It's, it's the kind of thing where five years ago nobody had written one, they weren't sure what to do with these things, they were just asking their friends, and now many people have used one and have an example of copy. We're happy to help with this kind of thing if you have, uh, if you have questions on it. Another project that we recently got involved with in research IT um, is around kind of the broad set of issues related to visualization. Right? So within research IT, we knew that we can't just focus on scientific computing, research data management. Research is changing all the time. So we have to be paying attention to that landscape, getting out there, talking to the graduate students, the undergraduate students who are starting to do new things with new technologies, talking to researchers in computer science about, about services that they're developing that might have an application in another area. Visualization is one of those things that you know, we, we certainly want it to track. Um, this year we had an opportunity to work with the Hearst Museum of Anthropology on a project to do some photogrammetry. So the Hearst Museum is, and UC Berkeley are part of a four UC project called the, the UC Catalyst um, At Risk Archaeological, At Risk Cultural Heritage and the Digital Humanities. That's a word actually from the UC Office of the President to four campuses, UC Berkeley, UC San Diego, UCLA, and Merced to install a set of visualization environments. This is basically a set of 3D TVs hooked up to a high-end graphics, basically a high-end computer, a workstation. And then this is showing 3D views of at-risk cultural heritage sites. And, and actually, how many people have actually seen this over at the Hearst? A 
great a bunch of people. Okay, so some of what you see there, okay, so there's Luxor in Egypt, that, that's great. Um, but they have some things over there that are not really at risk cultural heritage sites. There's a stone bear at UC San Diego. I don't, I don't think that's a cultural preservation kind of play there where they're really concerned about that thing being torn down. But, but the notion is that, that you could use these shared platforms, actually a network of these visualization environments to both record and share out information about cultural heritage sites, archaeological sites. They're at risk due to uh, whether, whether it's terrorism or erosion. This is a way, another way for a museum to help kind of store, record, and share, and curate this kind of information. So I got involved with this because I could see that um, there was a lot of work to do. And I just thought it was just really interesting an opportunity for research IT to get actually some hands-on experience with visualization, visualization technologies, photogrammetry, etc. So and Ben Porter, the director in the Hearst, has been such a great partner on this. He's been so helpful, um, actually getting hands-on, helping support a team of students that we hired first in the spring, but they really got started over the summer uh, to go into the Hearst Museum collections and start doing some photogrammetry. And um, let me just go on to the next slide, which has um, again some, some of our partners here. Uh, there's a little little movie of the, the first wave over there in action. Our, our goals are to get some of the, some of the muse museum content, excuse me, from the Hearst actually displaying here too, so that you could have uh, an, an archaeological object on a site or a Greek vase or something like that actually displaying in this, and you could zoom way into it or you know, look at the bottom of it, which you can't usually see if it's in an exhibition, it's, you know, it's sitting on something and you want to see all angles of this object. Um, so you know, we've actually created a bunch of models and now we need to figure out how to get these built in to the, uh, the application that runs on this, on the, what we call the first K. So um, you can see here we have some other partners here on campus through the Citrus and the Pacific Research Platform. That's another NSF funded or project that's looking at what could we do with high speed networks between the different campuses to really enable large data and data intensive research to happen more in real time. How many people currently are using like thumb drives or portable hard drives to move their data from the, either the field to their compute or from a scanner to a computer? Like everybody is using a thumb drive, right? Well, what if the network were just so fast that you didn't have to do that? So that, that's kind of the goal of the Pacific Research Platform is Campuses and the states have actually, and the federal government has invested a lot, a lot of money in some of that underlying network technology. But that doesn't mean that that the, that the high speed network you know, comes to Nico's office. Um, it doesn't mean that the software that you're using on your computer knows how to take advantage of that high speed network. So there's still a lot of work to do to, to unlock that potential. The reason, another reason I really like this is. This project is at its site. It's just right at the intersection of research, teaching and learning, and also public service, right? Because that's that's those are the roles of the museums. And I work a lot with the museums on campus. I love them. And, and this is a, a, a I mentioned that we've done this reorganization where research IT has joined with educational technology, Center for Teaching and Learning. This to me is, is, is one of those perfect intersections. Um, I'll mention just a few things about kind of our approach to this. Um, we've, we've done this current project here really on a shoestring. We've got a little bit of investment from research IT. Um, we've got a, we have some funds from this UC Catalyst project that, that actually built the visualization environment. We applied for funds from the Student Technology Fund. You know, students pay a technology fee, and most of that goes to things like Adobe and Microsoft and some of those some of the big expensive things. But they also have an open competition for kind of technology, innovative technology projects. And so we applied for a small amount of funds to hire some undergraduate students to help really get into, into the Hearst Museum collections, do more um, photogrammetry, and then build out the applications to display those things in the Hearst Museum. Um, and so we've just done you know, small, small amounts of funding. Funding have, have really helped us there. Um, the fact that we have museum at this museum with this incredible content is just such a powerful thing. When I talk to my colleagues at UC San Diego um, or 
even at Ever said where they're working with some, some really good archaeologists too. And I say, well, you know, we've got 3.8 million objects to work from. We've got a museum director who's actually doing the object handling himself, and, and staff there are really into we, We've turned our work into a museum exhibit. Over, over the summer, we were doing photogrammetry Fridays, right? So that we would actually be there in the museum working at the first cave itself. Um, with the students and visitors would be coming by and we'd be telling them what we, would, what we were doing. And it was, it was just great. I had such a great summer. I mean, this was like a job on top of my other jobs, but um, just, just fantastic. So, and also working with students, been great. It's been a lot of fun. Practice and learn from mistakes. Wow, we, we've made some really ugly 3D models. I gotta tell you, we've made a lot of mistakes. How many people have actually done some photogrammetry? I see some familiar faces. Um, okay, yeah, so you probably know it's not, it's, it's amazing, but it's not like 100% perfect every time. There are plenty of opportunities to make mistakes, and so we learn from those mistakes and we, and we move on. We consult with experts. We've had Michael Ashley from Codify. Uh, we had an undergraduate, what was that, uh, what's that, what's the guy's uh, name? Devlin Gandy. Devlin Gandy came through, and he's been doing a lot of this work as well, um, and so we're, we're learning a lot from experts, but there's still a lot of learning. And again, I mentioned we're also trying to push some of the processing to faster technology. So you can see this, like, how much of this is a technology project? It's, there, there's technology in it, but there's so much, so much else going on to really that enable technology to be powerful and useful. Oh, OK, so museum informatics and collection space. This is another program that, that we work on in research IT. Uh, this has been a, a Andrew Mellon Foundation funded project to develop an open source software package that museums can use to track information about their objects as well as all the transactions. You know, what's on loan, what's on exhibit, um, where did it come from? And this was an open source kind of community source project to develop something that could be used in art museums, in anthropology museums, in science museums, in kind of popular material culture museums. Um, and it's in use, in, in use um, kind of around the country and, and in a few places globally as well. So um, this is not visible in any way, but a, a museum collection management system is a really complex piece of software. I mean, you think of the, the metadata, all the object, all the data that you could use to describe an object, that's already a pretty complicated model. Right? Um, and museum people are, any, anybody from the Hearst here? Am I gonna offend anybody? Is he a former director in the back there? Okay. Um, they're crazy about, the, <laughs> they're crazy in general. I love, that these are crazy people. The, the level of kind of data that they wanna report about every object, is, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and so we had to come up with this extremely rich data model. You're seeing the first, 2% of the cataloging screen, so it scrolls there to about the back of the room. But then along the side, there are all these transactions, like the conservation. What conservation has this object been subjected to? Exhibition information, um, has it been on loan? And all of those, again, recording everything about those transactions. So this has been a fascinating um, kind of software and, and kind of information ecosystem project. One of the things that we'll be presenting um, at the SAAs about when we, when we talk about this collection space system is that once the museums really became very comfortable with their information and the quality of their data, then they said, now, now we have to unleash the strategic power of this information. So how can we use this to address our most strategic issues, things like um, you know, sharing information with the public, but not, not all information, protecting some information, how can we use this to really improve the quality of our data? Uh, how can we support researchers who want to find out what's in our collection? How can we make it easier for our staff to re respond to requests for, for, for research visits, those kinds of things? So on top of collection space, we, we use the API then to build a set of portals and other applications that are, are being used a lot right now. Um, and I just put the the link here to the, the first link, Web Apps C Space Berkeley EDU, is actually has links not only to the Hearst Museum of Anthropology, but also the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive, the University of Jepson Herbaria, and the UC Botanical Garden, which is a, a living collection. So that's one of the other museums on campus that we work with. Uh, and then this is the link to the, the, the Hearst Museum um, search portal. And it's just fascinating. 
again, 3.8 million objects is just an amazing collection. All right, so actually, so now we're going to actually talk a little bit more about the um, what we've done with the archaeological research facility in this analytics environments on demand service. So again, this is the, the virtual research environment where um, we're trying to build this out so that it can be useful. So you, you don't have to get everything installed and licensed and pay for something yourself. This could be something that, that could, I think could be really, really powerful. Nico has been you know, the person really helping drive what that should look like. Um, so Nico, do you, do you want to kind of talk sure. about? I think you can talk about these four minutes. Um, so the idea here is that we can provide access to a Windows desktop in a browser accessible on a nine-year-old Mac, for example. So should I do a live demo? Of your it's just a, I'm gonna just, I want you guys to see how easy this is. Um, it's a great man. If I can find my mouse pointer. There it is. All right, so browser window. You go Citrix. Once you in there, you sign up with your CalNet ID. And that's my that's just all my CalNet information, Active Directory. So it's syncing with the campus-wide Windows or you know, directory system. And then I have access to a number of these. Uh, Abby Fine Reader is something we have, we we can provide you access to this way. There's an issue with license with our you know with the number of licenses we have and scheduling. So we can't like open the you know, open the gate all the time, you might have to coordinate with others. But here's one, PIS Research. So the idea here is it'll be available to you, it'll store your data. Not, we don't have a ton of space available at this point, but if you really find it useful and your project invests in it, there's a condo storage option. That's part of the funding model for this program, is that projects that become really um, involved in this can pay uh, a little, and it, the window opened on my other screen here. They can pay something by the by the megabyte or the gigabyte or the terabyte. Here we go. Oh, no, it's stuck in the yeah, That's weird. It's not showing on the other screen. Okay, well. You can mirror the screen. Yeah, or I can just turn my Mac. I can turn my screen around. It doesn't seem to. Let's see. Okay, so anyway, maybe I'll just show you on here. So this, this just became the Windows desktop. See, they've got the start menu and everything. And I can launch ArcGIS. Um, so it's quite easy. And so the whole point is that this is running in Warren Hall, I believe. Yeah. And you know, I could start a job and I could like get it going on some big GIS project and then close my laptop, go to class, you know, open something else, reboot the laptop, and it's still running unless you actually shut down the Windows machine. Um, the other application here, go back to the slides. So this is the research version. That was the research version. Um, teaching is, so you could, you could also use it for teaching a class where you have some specialized software. Um, it has to be Windows or there's talk of a Linux, possibly a Linux version of this also launching. Um, and so you can have, uh, uh, this technical software available with identical experience for all the students in your workshop or your class, and they would just log into this web page and, and uh, have access to it. And now my Mac is turned into a Windows machine. I need to quit that. But I think that's all I was going to say there. One, one powerful aspect to this is that. Um, Licensing for much of the software is on an institutional level. So like Berkeley has access to, for example, I think four photo scan licenses. And it's perf perfectly fine for us to share those licenses within Berkeley institutions like this. But practically speaking, whose machine does it go on? Well, you can pool them and put them on here. And now four Berkeley people can sign in and simultaneously use photo scan. So it's, you know, it jumps, it solves that uh, obstacle. So. Cool. Thank you, Nika. So just, just a couple more, because I really want to make sure we have a few minutes at least for discussion. Um, so one of the things that's, that's driving some of this is that um, campus recently went through an IT strategic planning process called Reimagining IT. Probably nobody here except for like these four people and like, including myself have even heard of it. But this was you know, kind of a nine month process to look at you know, what should we be doing 
to be more, um, to, to help the campus really respond to the, the situation we're in now. I think that the main goal that's stated here, or the single goal, is to enable UC Berkeley to remain a great public university and to solve the campus financial crisis. What's that? So let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Isn't that great? That's a great goal. So, so how do you get there? So, so within that, so, oh, because that's actually the objective. The first goal within that, and all, all the IT people are going to solve this problem themselves. Yeah. <laughs> but the first goal is that all faculty and students have the tools and data they need to advance research, teaching, and learning student success. So that's so, so this kind of an iterative process where you draw, drill down into more specific things. The first strategy supporting that goal is to support major campus teaching, research, and public service initiatives each year, reallocate IT funding. So we're, we're trying to make the case that you know, most the, the way the campus has evolved and the way the budget evolved is that a lot of the IT spend, all the finances, go to administrative systems like you know, payroll and, and the financial system and procurement. All those things are important, but do they need to be the, the best they are? or should we actually have, a, that they could possibly be rather, or should we actually have a little bit more funding for some research, teaching, and learning services? Should we really make sure that those are improved or that more services and capabilities are available? Uh, so I was very involved in, in this process. It was another job on top of my other jobs for about nine months uh, to develop this plan. And now we're actually saying like, okay, so this, this is what we're saying. We, we want to support this, this goal and this strategy. So, so what do we do? Some of the things that I've told you about, of having some licensed software, having some more flexible compute environments, having, you know, like we have more access to things like Box and Drive, really finding out, how, finding out how to make those helpful to researchers, teachers, and learners, how to make those be effective parts of what you use uh, in your day-to-day -day work, that, that's kind of some of the next steps. Part of that is hearing from you about, about what, what you would like and also creative in what you were doing that maybe other people could also you know, take advantage of. Um, we actually have a, a couple of other um, sets of information here about grants and things like that. And I think that, I know that Nico's gonna have those available on the ARC website. So is it okay if we kind of skip over some of this? Yeah, this is, those are just links to grant programs and other labs on campus that you, you may be interested in. In pursuing, and I'm going to link to this. I'm going to paste this into our website and send you guys the link. But if you're not aware of GLAB, Bids, and GIF, um, then you really should definitely. You know, oh yeah, that's right. I wanted, in fact, I wanted to mention. So, so partnerships with who? Does everybody know about the DLab? Is that DLab? So it's in Barrows Hall, um, and also the Berkeley Institute for Data Science Bids, which is in the library, is also a great partner and a great environment to learn from other people. I definitely that and we have some really good and strong relationships with those groups so please feel free to, to track us down to talk about those things um, so I want to just at least spend seven minutes here um, asking you all some questions so maybe we could even get the lights up and uh, so, so one thing I'd like to hear is what other kind of technology uses are you hearing about some kind of you know we talked about the visualization the analytic environments what, what are the things that you all are doing or that that you would like to be able to do but you don't have access to equipment or something here on campus. So I'm going to open it up. If you have questions or if you have ideas, I'd love to, I'd love to hear things that are going on. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm the only one in this situation, <laughs> but coming at this from sort of more humanities background, I am lacking some fairly basic computer skills, and I find myself needing to construct and deal with databases. I don't know the first thing about databases, MySQL, any of that. You guys have any sort of training program for stuff that we don't, is it like advanced fancy stuff, just like basic computer stuff for mm -hmm. non-computer people? Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely, and no, you are not one of them. So I think there are a number of good resources, and I think, uh, and actually that was one of the, we're gonna add a slide with kind of training resources. The DLab, even though it's kind of the social sciences DLab, that's a great place, and they will work with, with anybody. So they have, uh, have you checked out their course offering? Actually, I have. I took their intro to programming. I've forgotten it all. I took their intro to R. I've also forgotten it Okay. All. So <laughs> this is how it goes. Uh, yeah. But, no, I understand. Some of it is it's either not at the right level or yeah. not at the right time. Exactly. Right? Right. Right. 
So, and that's where consulting can help. So, for instance, uh, what I'd suggest is, you know, if you're at a point where you're actually want to start working on like, how the data model would look or something like that, you can send email to research data at berkeley.tv. We can schedule a consultation. You can sit down, uh, kind of get a, a sense of where you are in your project right now, and then you, you maybe do some, some direct help or say, like, well, maybe it's maybe it wasn't the R class. Maybe what you needed was was this class or oh, there's this resource on Linda.com, which I think we we all have access to now. Is that capacity has access to Linda.com? Actually, do you know, do you know who has access to that to Linda.com, Owen? I think they were trying to add students. They're trying to add students to Linda.com because that's a, a great resource. Can you briefly tell us what that is? Linda.com. Actually, I'm going to you No. Linda.com is considered by some sort of the premier online training outfit for largely for computer-based applications. Um, they've been around for, it's a very competitive marketplace and some of it just really gone on ahead. Um, and what's different now is the university has um, come up with the money to start licensing it so that initially it was just for faculty and staff, but my understanding is they're, they either have this summer or about to extend the license for the entire community. So faculty and staff can already get it through that um, portal that you may have seen called Blue, Blue Not Perfect, which is now the Learning Center, I think it's been rebranded. So that you should be able to find it there, and then I think there's going to be some announcements about how students can get access. Yeah, so for example, you could probably take like a 20 hour course in Final Maker Pro, and it's videos and exercises and things like that on Linda.com. Final cut. Are you saying Linda, L I N D A? Oh, my. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, pay, I, I don't know why I didn't know about this. Yeah. Because I pay like $150 at the moment just to have a, a three months or five months license. So if oh. I can get it through the university, yeah. you know, that, I never saw, that, I've never seen anything about that. So you kept that a well guarded secret. <laughs> I don't know why. You know when your connections. What? You know when your connections. No, I know my connection. <laughs> but now, now it's going to be renewed. Yeah, it's, it is a great resource. So thank you. It's and that's what I smile for it. It's going to be structured in small, manageable modules. So, you, I mean, you hit on exactly the case. When you really want to build your data model, that's when you want to concentrate on that part. You don't need a whole course on MySQL. You just want to get in and be able to do it. And they, they, that tends to be a strength of these. Yeah. They're really good. Question in the back. Um, I have a question about whether or not you guys also have this creating spaces. Like, I don't know anyone in the computer science department that's also a graduate student. And I would love to collaborate with another graduate student because I know that they're hungry for data. And we have the data. And they have the hunger. And I want to feed them. But I don't know any of them. Yeah. So are you guys also thinking about creating collaborative spaces where you introduce graduate students from different programs that can work with each other? Very each other? dying to answer that. <laughs> <All Yeah. right. laughs> so, so I think that's that's been a big question on this campus uh, for a long time, and uh, you may or may not have heard there's a new division on campus, the data science division, okay. and it's partly you know um, in, in spirit trying to address some of that question. Um, uh, BIDS, the Berkeley Institute for Data Science, which has been around on campus in the Doe Library on the main floor for several years, has been kind of the first experiment around that that, that sort of predated the, the data science division. Um, uh, they just on, onboarded their newest cohort of, of grad students and postdocs within BIDS. I think that would be a great place um, to go to, to make those kinds of connections. They have formal talks and they also have informal events like teas and, and uh, they also have working groups. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, the question earlier, uh, or, or your name, but um, I think um, uh, if you're trying to connect with people, it's a great physical space to go and do yeah. that. Um, if you're trying to learn things, they're also doing um, formal and more informal trainings in the form of like, trying to build a community together. So for example, on Wednesdays, Wednesday afternoons, later today in fact, the Hacker Within is a community group that meets, that like, kind of mixes people from lots of different domains together, mm -hmm. lots of different, you know, from completely beginning levels to advanced levels in the same room around different topics. And so you can go propose a topic, 
or meet other people in the community that kind of augment some of the official training stuff in ways that like sometimes when you learn something, um, you don't know the kinds of questions you might want to ask. Like some things are ungoogleable mm -hmm. because it's like, oh, I don't even know what, what question to ask here. And so that community is a great one to tap into. And that's all out of the well, the Institute for Data Science? It's in the underground floor, the one right across yeah. from that yeah. lovely lunch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, just following up on that, they, they also have a, an annual poster session. That's a great place to Yeah, it's a great place to chat with people. Mm -hmm. And remember, we have awesome content in our theology. A lot of people are excited about what we have to talk about, even if you don't have the technical skills. So just bringing yeah. that knowledge to the domain expertise is, is definitely an asset. Um, a lot of what you've been showing us is on the web, you know, access on the web, but not all of it. And some of these meetings, obviously, are not, you know, there's an aspect of this which is physical on campus. Yeah. I'm just wondering, you know, how you see research IT, whether it's something that you really need to be on campus to take advantage of, or can it be done like the library research now mm -hmm. off campus? Mm -hmm. Well, that's where the virtualized research environments and some of that really, really can come in and become, become quite powerful. So I, I'd say it's, it's yes, it's all of it. Uh, and certainly we're seeing that the, the kind of community part of this is, is extremely important. And we've spent a lot of time investing in building a community with, with our other kind of service provider organizations, Research ID, with Educational Technology, with Campus Shared Services, with the library, because we realize we're all trying to help basically the same people, which are people like you. So, but, but for years, you know, we, we, every, we all talk about the silos, we've all created our, our individual silos, and we've been working very hard to break those down. But so the community part of this has been really important. And, and we, the last two years, it's just been, I would say, you know, a game changer in terms of how successful we've been and building those kind of relationships. What, what I might add to that, um, uh, thinking about the work that's done on Marketology and what we've done on Nico, is um, see how some of these tools can fit into your field work and, and, and be a tool when you're there. So I don't know if you might want to say kind of what Susan was doing. Oh, yeah, so Susan Powell from, uh, from the Math and Imagery Library was in Mongolia doing some field project, and she was trying to use ArcGIS on on this AOD, the San Local Environments on Demand. And she, uh, so she was able to sign in from, I think she was in Ulan Bator. She, she had a pretty good web connection. But one thing we're working on is making sort of a slimmed down version that will run on a, on a um, rather weak internet connection so that you have access to this really powerful computer and all the, you know, no licensing headaches. Um, and you can set up a job. Or you, the other thing you can do is transfer data really fast because you know, the Warren Hall is on the gigabit. You know, it's on a really fast web connection. So you, things move back and forth from that AOD machine to Google Drive and Box really quickly. And then you can do your work through that um, in a really cool environment. Maybe one last question, if that. Well, great. Thanks so much. Everybody. Again, uh, research data at Berkeley.edu. You can send email. Christophe Hoffman at Berkeley.edu. Meet me. Go to us how to get in touch with us. And we'd love to make, we'd love to talk. So thank you very much.